Well, Anders, Sandra, thank you for coming today and joining this uh, webinar about the car sharing market and the future growth potential. I'm very happy that um, you accepted our invitation and uh, we decided to set this up together. And also we have a lot of attendees, of course, uh, joining us today in uh, this webinar series that we started. Um, let us please start first of all with uh, short presentations about yourselves and also your companies and also why are you actually working in car sharing? Because that's probably one of those key questions that everyone is asking themselves. Maybe Sandra, do you want to go first? Sure. Good. For me, it's morning, so I'm all the North Americans are on a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, you guys are in the evening. You're a little bit ahead of me. Anyway, I'm dialing in from Vancouver, which is why it's morning. And I've been working in the shared mobility space for the last 10 years. Um, started in car sharing, personally with Car2Go, um, introducing that program in the Canadian market. Um, but you invited me here as the founder and CEO of MoveMe, which is a small boutique agency. And all we do is um, essentially plan, launch new shared mobility services. And we've done, we've been involved in about 50 projects now. Um, that's in the last five years. And I would say the bulk of it is in car share. We work really in three areas. Car share is obviously, because that's where I come from, one of our key uh, markets. The second one is micro mobility, more focused on e mopeds and e bikes rather than the kick scooters. And then the last one is, you know, mobility as a service. I always talk about integrating because now you have all these new forms. How do you connect them better? Um, whether that's with public transit or just amongst each other. So that's the three areas. Why am I here um, or why am I working in car sharing? Because as much as I would like to say we do not need cars anymore anytime soon, that's just simply not true, right? You have use cases like you go shopping, you need a certain amount of um, cargo space to get that home. You go on a camping trip. I have a little daughter. I need to get her somehow in a safe car seat. Um, around so there is times when I do think you need a car and because I don't think we need to own an asset that literally sits around what well in our case now during COVID 98% um, of the time it just sits somewhere right so I think it's a complete waste of land use so I that's the reason I work in car share and I've continued to work in car share and I believe it's part of the mix it's not the only thing it's one piece of the puzzle do you still own a car Yes, we do. I, I should say, I don't, it's my partners, it's my excuse, but <laughs> we, I actually do for the first time in my life because we have, as I say, we have a daughter and car sharing is not working anymore and it's, I'm very sad. It was. Uh, this is when the use case maybe reached its limit because also I was just using car sharing for years and then uh, we had the first one and then the second one and then the car came, unfortunately, but it's sitting around most of the time. Exactly. But, um, it's 98% of the time. It's a ridiculous waste. Most probably, <laughs> Anders, you don't have a car, right? Because you have so many cars in Copenhagen you can just use, right? Of green mobility. I have so, I have so many EVs to choose from. Exactly. <laughs> More than 400 every day. Do you want to you wanna quickly introduce yourself and also green mobility and why car sharing is actually getting much bigger and also why we can celebrate your 100,000 customers today, actually? which is a milestone, right, for the company? It is, it is. We just uh, had a, a huge milestone for, for us today, a uh, small celebration here at the office. Great, um, great. So my name is Anna Fell. I am um, VP of Investor Relations here at uh, Green Mobility. I'm also head of our ESG, so, so the sustainable part of our business. Uh, Green Mobility, we operate sustainable mobility, sustainable car sharing, uh, purely with, the, with EV fleets, and we've been doing that since 2016. Um, uh, the company was founded here in Copenhagen, but we are now operational in, in four cities. So in addition to Copenhagen, also in Aarhus, uh, second largest city of Denmark, and in Malmö and Gothenburg in Sweden, and in a few weeks as well in, in Belgium, uh, Antwerp and Ghent. Uh, today we operate a, a total fleet of 700 EVs. Um, so a, uh, and for us, uh, from the beginning, uh, it has never been a choice of, of what kind of a car we should use. It's always been uh, with a clear focus on the environment. Uh, so EVs were, were natural from the, from the beginning. For us, it's, it's very much about creating a better city environment um, than, than we have today. So part of that is, of course, um, 
uh, reduce the, the pollution, reduce the CO2 emissions, uh, but at the same time also reduce uh, private cars in the cities. Uh, I think that's that's another hassle that we have. We have simply too many cars, so traffic jams, uh, parking issues, and, and so on. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being in Kashang for, for about three years now, um, and um, I think it, it's one of the industries where we see a huge growth at the moment. Uh, there's been so much development. Uh, well, when I started this three years ago, there were only a few people uh, who, who knew about EVs, even less actually driving them. Very few uh, knowing about Kashang, at least in Denmark. Now it's, it's um, completely different. It's, it's become an actual service in, in most uh, larger cities. Um, not only around Europe, but, but in the world. I think now we're, we're seeing the accelerated growth. Um, and a good example of that was, was our uh, milestone today where we crossed 100,000 customers. Um, so, so there are more and more customers switching into shared mobility uh, and also, of course, uh, sustainable solutions. What is, what is driving this? What's the, the growth story behind car sharing right now? Because um, as we also, of course, we operate in um, many different markets now with the micro mobility solutions, but also car sharing solutions. We, of course, we saw a drop in usage, right, during COVID at some stage because there was a lockdown all across the world, pretty much, right? People couldn't really leave their houses. But now it's going up again. What are those uh, driving factors for you that you maybe see in the Nordics, Anders, but then also what's happening in North American markets? Um, maybe Anders, you want to go yeah. first? I, I think there is um, it's several things. Uh, of course, the, this general notion on, and awareness about uh, car sharing is growing. So, so there's a natural growth effect of that. But definitely we've seen in, in the last few months uh, a clear trend moving into more individual mobility. Um, mm. uh, of course, driven to, to a large extent by COVID uh, that uh, you want to be in an environment where at least there are not as, as many uh, strangers around you. I think there's, there's a small fear in the society at the moment. But also the fact that it's become uh, way well functioning um, and it's, it is as... as uh, as uh, Sam was saying before, it's, it's an on-demand solution. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, more and more people are simply choosing not to own the asset, um, not to own, have the hassles of a car with the insurance, parking issues, and so on. What's your What's your availability in um, in Copenhagen, if you don't mind like asking? Well, it, of course, that naturally depends a lot um, on what, what time, time of day. Right? Time, there's, yeah. There will always be peaks. But an interesting thing we, we also see at the moment is that it, it, it sort of the curve flattens out. So you, mm. you're used to seeing two spikes in the day, of course, in the morning and afternoon. But now, as we still have a fair degree of people working from home, but also more and more companies um, allowing for more flexible working hours than, than before COVID. So there are still peaks, but it's evening out. We see much more traffic early in the morning, in the middle of the day, and at the end of the day. So actually that drives up um, availability as well. Okay, great, great. Now, um, I mean, you could also argue the other way around, right? There's actually a surge in car subscriptions, unfortunately, you could maybe say. People more interested, of course, in flexibility. And uh, Cluno, which is the company we work with here in Germany, said that now 24%, actually, it was a big survey done, do consider getting a private car subscription. So you can also say, oh, it's actually going the other way around, right? And the people now are just going to lease their own car very flexibly just for a month if they want. It's going to cost them, what, I don't know, 300 to 500 euros. Is that a good thing? And how actually can we go the other way around? And how actually does it look in North America? Because in North America, we're right now very dominated by the individual car use, right? How do you incentivize people? And how is it growing over there? What do you think, Sandra? Um, I think the, you know, COVID has unearthed kind of similar trends that, that Andres has just pointed out. We've done a large, like the largest independent Metro Vancouver survey, just understanding, you know, how okay. have lifestyle habits changed and also um, what are people considering when it comes to transportation? So I think there's a couple of things. One is health is all of a sudden the most important decision factor, which I have never seen in my entire 10 years. It was maybe like two people that mentioned health. Now it's all of a sudden become important. Um, 
which goes to the trend towards more individualistic, you know, modes. You want to control the vehicle or you want to own it. So you have control mm. over who used it. Right. And so I think there's two things that happened. One is there's more car um, subscriptions, more interest in car. I should actually say for Vancouver, we were surprised. We expected it to be in kind of that 26%. Uh, it can get, came back at a 14% of people are considering. And of those 14, only I think about seven can actually afford to purchase. The other seven are would like to, but they can't afford because of mm. also the economic impact of the pandemic, right? Um, but the other, the group that really won, and I'm, I'm hearing the same from Europe, is actually individual bike sales have gone through the roof. Like it's yeah. impossible to get an e-bike at the moment in North America or a trailer for a bike it's months of waiting, right? So it's just the shift generally towards more individual, not just towards the car. Um, what can we do? I think one of the things that cities are actually doing quite well, in my opinion anyway, is introducing infrastructure that supports micromobility. So bikes and, you know, more active forms rather than supporting infrastructure or building more infrastructure for cars. I think that would be probably the worst thing they could do right now because I always say if you buy a car now because you're worried about health, you're locked into that for the next 10 years, right? That it's a purchase that you do it and you change your behavior because you have it in your parking garage. So um, I think that's probably the worst thing. So I think in tandem kind of us building services to support so people have choices. And, and the other thing I will say is, um, the feedback on the health side is that people are less worried about sharing a vehicle consecutively. You know, I had it, then you have it because I can control, I can wipe down the steering wheel and uh, you know, the gear shift um, versus I'm in a, in a vehicle with lots of other people that I have no control over how close we are. Um, yeah, of course, of course. So, so I think the other thing here I mean. is, yeah, exactly. So the thing, mm. I think the other thing here is we have to build this ecosystem of more nimble options if we want to maintain in the future, a, you know, a public transit first and then shared modes and then individual vehicles later. But yeah, that's what we've seen here in North America. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, bike sales, I guess, are the same all over the world, right? I mean, there have never been so many, uh, which is amazing. And uh, you also have some really cool um, bike tech companies now emerging, like Cowboy out of Brussels. Or uh, one move out of Amsterdam, they all raised their new funding, and um, the bikes are uh, very, very nice looking and all powered, right? Electric powered. And um, I am also using an e bike actually, and I never thought I would, but it's actually quite handy, I have to say. And uh, now I can transport my two kids in a nice and eco friendly way in the morning, and I always find a parking spot. So um, mm -hmm. it's amazing. It really works for me. Um, but what are those other maybe mega trends that will drive us in the future? Because now, I mean, it's okay, 2020. How do you think car sharing will look in 2025? Um, are there any like trends that you see coming? I mean, how will green mobility develop? And how do you also see maybe the, the market in Canada or the US develop towards more car sharing use? Because in the end, what we're all fighting for, what also what Wunder is fighting for is, of course, that people don't really need to use the individual car anymore or maybe just lease one or rent one if really needed because you want to go for those skiing holidays so maybe you need a jeep or something and four by four but in the end of the day if we make it more flexible then you really don't need to own a car how do we get there i think there's there's uh, several things that need to happen but at least in theory on, on, on in, we can all agree that moving swiftly through a city uh, with clean air is something we would all like to see oh, yeah. still the, the still the and, and i'm sure you would love it on, on your on your bike but still there is a, there's a fair way to go uh, in most cities. So this, it is a combination of, of um, political support uh, from city, city councils, private companies like, like uh, the ones that, that you and I, uh, we all represent, um, and also um, funding investment in, into this sector. Um, mm. Because for, for private cars to, to truly be taken out of, uh, of the city space, we need a multitude of, of services. Um, while I would love to have just only car sharing, um, we need to, of course, also have still public transport. Um, we won't be able to move as many people as a train. So I think at the moment where there's a bit of, of, of fear with, with wearing masks and so on in, in, in public transport, that will hopefully go away uh, again. But 
but we need a combination of, sort of mass movers, long distance, um, uh, short distance, like uh, your bicycle, um, and then the, this, uh, this mid distance that, uh, that a car sharing solves. Uh, when you have that, and you have, of course, enough, then, um, then there's no point in bringing private cars into the city. And having enough of that also ensures that you have constant availability. Of course, that, that is a cha challenge, uh, something that we have to meet. Um, mm. If you live in a city with half a million, million, two million, whatever, then obviously uh, 400 or 1,000 cars is not going to be enough. But it's still going to yeah, be not. much, much less than what you see today. But but how do you how do you change that? And maybe one example I had in, in my mind was um, the Route 66 in the US, right? It actually does a haul and it's a day dependent, right? So meaning if you want to take it in the morning, you actually pay, I don't know, $60 or something to use this road. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just a parking lot. It's a moving parking lot. So the same is happening in London. Why don't we just tax private vehicles going through the city? And is there one city that you believe is actually doing that very well? Maybe first in North America, but then also in Europe. What do you think, Sandra? Because how else would you get the private vehicles out of the city? Because mm -hmm. it's so convenient, right? Of course, if right. I live in Hamburg, I have a great big car. Why don't I just use it? Right. I, I think there's a couple of things of how you can make it inconvenient. So one is obviously you can start distributing the cost of the road more fairly. And, you know, road infrastructure is quite expensive and we yeah. don't really pay enough <laughs> as individual users. So that's one way. I think you can also just make it really uncomfortable to, let's say, find parking. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things, um, the city of Portland has a program in, in only two, anyway, it is kind of complicated how they set up their parking, neighborhood parking, but in two of the neighborhoods, they have a program. If you give up your parking spot, so if you say, I don't use it because I use alternative modes, bike, car share, whatever, um, you actually get a subsidy. So you get up to, I mm. think, $900 a year towards your alternative mode. So towards car share, uh, public transit, ride hill even. So Uber and Lyft have, um, there is a bike share, there is a kick scooter. So for all of that, so you get a bundle, right? So now you're shifting. So A, it made it uncomfortable for me because there's less and less parking available. But also if, I, if I'm willing to just say, I don't need it. And so city put in, I don't know, a pop-up, um, you know, neighborhood cafe extension that we have all the patios that are popping up. I'll give it up. I'm happy. I also get something for it. So I think there's multiple ways, right? It's the stick approach. It's the, the carrot approach. Um, so you can do it in two ways. I think the other place where I personally st start seeing, you know, pricing the curb more fairly is actually on the shared fleet side. So um, mm -hmm. the city of Vancouver, if you guys don't know, we waited 100 years, maybe not 100, but we waited a long time to get Uber and Lyft. We literally got it just before the pandemic. Mm. Now, what that did is it allowed the city to understand what the problems are, let's say in San Francisco or New York, you know, where that the congestion in already congested neighbor um, set, uh, areas increased. What can they do? And so one of the interesting things they did is they introduced the congestion uh, pricing fee, pick up and drop off fee in the downtown core. But, and this is probably where Anders is like, yeah, we know that we've done that in Europe already. If it's <laughs> EV, it's half the price. And if it's an accessible vehicle, so increasing equity, you know, then it's, they pay nothing. Um, so there is, I think cities also have the ability, the curb is essentially their most powerful way of, mm. of managing what comes in and out of their city, I think. But that's very forward looking, right? I'm not so sure how, if every city would actually um, <laughs> consider this, right? And also the Potter example is quite amazing in my opinion. What I do in Europe right now is, I mean, they do um, subsidize uh, the, if you purchase a, a, an electric bike or even a scooter right now, but there's nothing towards um, uh, car sharing, I believe. Not yet, not to my knowledge. Or what do you think, Anders? Is there something that oh, you there is, there is actually, there is actually, um, I, I I actually, before Seth was saying, I, I put down a little note about the, the carrot versus the stick. Uh, I think, and it is very fundamental. Uh, you see a lot of cities, a lot of politicians set out clear CO2 saving goals, whether it's 25, 2030, but we still, in many cities, many countries, lack the, the 
specific sort of plans and actions, how do we actually achieve that? We've seen different examples, um, but and, and from, from my hometown in Copenhagen, the, the, sort of the typical thing is, okay, let's increase the cost of parking. Then mm. probably people got to stay home. No, no, no. They're just accepting that this is a more expensive way. But right they got now. the money anyway, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or they will save on something else because, well, yeah. I need to go to work. They, they, it's not forcing people to think in different modes. Mm. Uh, if we turn to, to uh, another more uh, carrot example is in, in Oslo, uh, which is uh, the, the largest uh, EV market in the world, uh, relatively speak. They have put up free parking, the use of bus lanes when you drive an EV, um, free ferries, uh, no uh, toll road taxes for EVs. Mind you, they are slowly reinstating these because uh, they ended up, uh, I think, losing too much money in, in the city of Oslo. But, but what they have achieved is that more than 50% of the, the entire carpool in Norway is now EV-based. Mm. So, so you're putting out a lot of, of not only cash incentives, but also other things. And I think for, for for us to truly change mobility, it has to be very simple because mm. to, to be quicker, cheaper, and better than what I'm used to today, you have to motivate people to change my behavior. That's some of the most difficult things to do. I'm used to, I know my car, I have the radio station set, all that. But once you try that, um, and, and we, we uh, sometimes I, I li uh, listen on some of our customer calls and we, we have this uh, aha moment. Um, especially for new drivers, new customers, where they have some questions. So it's maybe their first time driving an EV. And at some point in the conversation, ah, this is so simple. I'm going to do this again. But you have to, you have to sort of take the first and steps. Maybe, and maybe you can even drive for free, right? Because uh, if I understand correctly, actually what Green Mobility does is give an incentives to their drivers to charge the vehicle then afterwards, which also makes it cheaper for you to run your operations. You have to, to remember, if you, if you own a car, um, the total cost of having it, it's more than just buying the car, leasing, whatever you do, but, mm -hmm. but the running cost of it. Um, and, and when you start comparing this, well, it, it, and, and you, you will get a cheaper solution in, in car sharing. I do realize that some, some people have to go on longer trips, uh, and, but there are different solutions for that, I think. But, mm -hmm. but in, the, in the city, uh, we have to find a simpler way. Um, but it is our task and the city's task as well to, to make it better than what you're used to. Otherwise, people are not going to change. Oh, yeah. No, no way. Or maybe force people to use different modes. But anyway, I may be a bit dramatic here. Um, I have no, but, it's a, but I think it's, it's, it's not going to be voluntarily. Then, then people just, okay, they, they're going to be mad at whether it's mm -hmm. the operators or the city or something else. Uh, it, it's going to feel like uh, you got an increase in, the, in your tax rate. Um, mm. So so you're not going to be very really happy about it. Now I got a couple of actually very interesting questions here already from the public. Um, the first one I'd like to throw at you is the following. Um, car sharing is much more feasible in highly populated mega cities. I'm not so sure what a mega city is and how we would quantify one. But on the other hand, city centers have the scarcity of parking lots. And now, yesterday, as we were actually preparing for this webinar, because we do now these days, uh, we thought about, okay, what is actually better, free-floating or station-based, right? And how do you think car sharing companies can actually solve this problem in a cost-effective way? I think it's mainly about parking lots. And how would you operate from your experience in different cities? What makes a city better for one model or another? And last question about this, isn't free-floating the best solution for growth? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that <laughs> would be think? quick what and easy, easy, easy. Yeah. But I think we we doing actually a lot to uh, disprove this about it only being mega cities. Uh, of course, you you have access to more potential customers and so on. But we've actually gone. Uh, um, Copenhagen is a city of uh, around seven hundred thousand, maybe eight hundred thousand. But uh, Aarhus, where we operate, and Malmo as well. Uh, that's about a quarter million uh, inhabitants, um, and and uh, always we expect to be profitable in within a year from now. We launched it nine months ago, so wow. yes, you can actually operate in smaller cities, uh, and that's also been a change. When when we started four years ago, we looked at a million plus. Now we actually look at a quarter million plus, um, and surely in time we will go to hundred thousand or maybe even smaller. Um, what are what are your um 
what are the main characteristics for you to choose a city? And also, Sandra, like, what, what do you think? And uh, we also talked yesterday about mm -hmm. um, actually the fact that there's one Canadian city, I believe, where you can only go in with station based, otherwise it's not going to work, right? Wasn't that the well, case? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Now I'm like, we're talking about Toronto. And I was good, I was actually gonna ah. say, you know, the mega city versus not. So my when I worked for Cardigo, my role was like looking at every Canadian city and what's the right market. My conviction, and I was one of the few voices in the company at the time, was that seven hundred thousand and less is actually much more successful than the Toronto and the New Yorks. And part mm. of that has to do with a, you have fantastic public transit and you have congestion already. So even if I have a car share car now, I still sit in congestion, even if it's free floating. It's almost impossible in those larger cities like Toronto or London is another good example where um, Drive Now pulled out, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have all these individual boroughs. Like in Toronto, we negotiated with 36 individual cities that now had to agree on curbside management, like on some sort of plan. And Case in point, they didn't agree. We launched with a kind of an A to B model on parking lots, um, which from an operational perspective was just way too expensive and eventually car to go pulled out. Um, and I think a station-based model, they, and, and I should also say the, the flip side of that is also the use case is much different. So people in, you know, in, in like a city like Vancouver, they use car to go Oh, car to go. They use free floating to kind of deal with the lines where they can't, where public transit just can't. Like north, south, east, west works great. If you want to get across the city, it takes you like an hour and a half and four mm. transfer. I'm exaggerating a bit, but so that's where it's Carter similar in Hamburg, perfect, actually. Right? Similar. But if you, if you, but they not always take them to go, you know, on weekend trips. Toronto, New York, both cities, the majority of, of users use them to drive out of the city on the weekend. Mm. So they, what's the point of having a free floating model? You, you're going out anyway and bringing it back at the end of the weekend. I will say though, if you want mass adoption, especially in a market that is not or less familiar with, uh, with car sharing, there is, there, I've seen it, I've seen it in Vancouver where there was a station base that had been here for years. Um, and the growth for both free floating and station based happened when the free floater came in because mm. it's, you know, mass adoption. It's just so much easier. It goes to Anders' mm. point. It's like, right. It's much more convenient. Um, and then you're like, ah, at the occasional time, I really like want to plan my trip and I want to book it in advance. And I want to know that, you know, three Saturdays from now I have a car. I'm also going to subscribe to the station based guy. So now you have both, which is great. Or we can solve that in free float as well. I'm, I'm wondering <laughs> one, one, one other question I got from the from uh, the people in this call actually now is uh, my 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 good friend Joseph, seal driver from <laughs> London, who I know was uh, working for Drive Now before, is asking, do you see a new wave of well-funded businesses ready to take on markets like London? And Anders, what's next for maybe green mobility? Is that a market you would go into? Um. Yeah, well, uh, I think in, in many or ways. others? Uh, Do you think uh, it's a good market? Um, currently, no, not London. Um, but and the challenge is actually uh, it's it's a structural thing uh, that uh, London is specific for that because it's it's actually not one city; it's thirty-three boroughs, mm. and they haven't coordinated parking rules. Mm. So we have to make agreements and have stickers and licenses for all the different boroughs, um, which is obviously a challenge. Um, so because we need to have some simple parking solution uh, so our customers don't have to worry about that um so i think for, for london let's wait but uh, but other cities for sure we've uh, we've came on saying we're kind of starting in helsinki finland uh, before end of year uh, and obviously um there are a, a number of cities in uh, in europe where uh, where it's obvious for us we are expanding that's that's our growth strategy we want to have much more cities um we've actually put out as, a, as well saying we want to be in 50 city, 15 cities by end of next year so naturally city side i think it is the cities where we can relatively easily find a parking structure ideally it's a free parking solution for EVs, but um but we also have cities where we where, where there's a payment structure 
um, but but a city that also sees the advantage in the, in car sharing and, and electric car sharing. Uh, Clearly, we have some infrastructure for charging as well. We can do it ourselves, but it, it's always easier if it's there. Um, but the political um, sort of support, uh, I think, is very positive as well. And, and we see, luckily, quite a lot of cities that is, is turning that way now. Mm -hmm. One question, just out of personal interest. Is there one successful car sharing company that does free floating and station-based at the same time in a perfect world? Cominoto. Cominoto. Really? Cominuto, yeah, it's a it's, it's a working. very old. It's wow. I think the oldest player in Canada and probably North America, out of Montreal, and they have this very interesting mix of a state. They started a station base, right, and then they moved towards the free floating, and they now also operate in Paris. Um, I think literally every single province except for British Columbia, which is where Vancouver is. All the car shares now belong to Cominuto, and so they have station based and free float. Some markets have free float, some have station based, some have both. Like Toronto, really? wow. an interesting mix. Um, okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, now, one question from the public as well uh, from my dear colleague Mel, that we all know and uh, very well, is um, Are there big US comp like are there big US uh, companies that surprise you that currently don't have an integrated car sharing into their business model? Are there any OEMs that actually should be having one or other big companies like insurance based that really should be having a car sharing model? Like that should invest in a car sharing? Like and maybe yes. I'm not entirely clear what the question is. Should they um, really invest in one? Yeah. So I have a nice, my, I have to be careful, right? I have worked <laughs> with a lot of OEMs, but a part of me is like, you know, they're great in product. They're not so great in service business. Like car share is a service business. It's mm -hmm. a very different beast. And it's also very technologically enabled. So I, I think the technical technology piece that, you know, you can buy in, but this, the service is a complete shift of mindset. So I don't know personally, um, I would like to see uh, OEMs, like maybe more of a strategy what um, Toyota has with, one of our projects is in Hawaii, it's called Hui, and it's the dealership that has essentially launched a pro project, but Toyota is obviously the supplier um, of the vehicles. And I think that's a great match because the dealer has like, they have that service mentality already. And they also mm. have a lot to lose right now with the way, you know, a car, um, products develop, but also like sale strategies develop. So I think that's a great partnership. I think something like this, I think will be successful. Now, insurance companies, oh, I wish every insurance company in North America had a foot somewhere, whether it's a car share or just some shared mobility program, mm -hmm. because then we wouldn't, our biggest challenge um, in a lot of new markets is getting insurance. Like that Hawaii project, it took us nine months to find somebody who wanted to underwrite it. Mm. Um, mm. So just from a purely selfish perspective, I wish all the insurance players would get into it. Would they? I'm not so sure. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, I'm not so sure. Very risk adverse when it comes to that. And, and you know, think about how lawsuits are handled in the US, mm. right? So mm. I think part of that challenge to get insurance companies on board in the u.s has to do with that uh, you know not being in the middle yeah. of a lawsuit I, I agree with you i mean we have also customers of course in in u.s and insurance is definitely one of the biggest challenges they face right and yes. it sometimes just breaks the business model because also the insurers that we know well of course just don't support this business model yet right and uh, are a bit scared of um what could happen if it goes wrong right mm -hmm. and it's also a challenge to us definitely um Anders, just to pick up on the service level again, actually, is that also something that is very important to you? And what really drives Green Mobility? Is it like a really service-driven, customer-centric company? Or what, what really, what, what makes you uh, win the game? I think it's, it's spot on. It is, we're not a tech company, we're not a car company, we're a service company. Um, and, and I would agree with, with Sandra, uh, maybe with a slightly different perspective, but, what we see from from OEMs is that uh, they have a different motivation in this mm. 
industry than we have, uh, mm. which is fully understandable. We see uh, different OEMs who sort of, uh, uh, try to do or are active in, in car sharing. Um, obviously, we have a few of the big ones um, who operate a lot of car sharing, but the, fundamentally, they are still a car manufacturer, and it is about sort of getting a return on the investment in factories and, and, and R&D and so on. Uh, and obviously, this is a good display for them to have uh, to have cars on the street in, in a car sharing solution. But it's not necessarily service driven. I think that is the key for, for car, well, a uh, very important key for car sharing is that as a customer, you expect to have a clean and nice car, it's ready to drive. Um, and, and operating that, sort of those small details uh, is, um, is, is key to our business. This is what, what we focus very much on with, with our street team, our customer service team, is, is constantly ensuring a readiness in the fleet. Um, because as a user, that is, that's what you're looking for, when and where, back to the on-demand from the beginning, I need a, a car, it should be ready. And yeah, what we see and some clean. of the, the other operators, uh, and I, I would expect an insurance company having a sort of a slightly different perspective as well, they would be much more risk focused. Okay, so don't park the car in this area of the city and no parking after 20, 10 o'clock in the evening and, and so on. Uh, so mm. uh, I, I don't think they would ever operate it. Um, so, so it is about doing what you're very good at, um, mm. and this is this is the core of our business uh, mm. to to um, to ensure that the car is always available when and where you need it. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I remember um, the last time I wanted to use a sixth car share here in Hamburg, and um, it was very dirty, so yeah. I didn't take it. Um, and you have you actually have several examples of, of poorly run car sharing operations. Uh, uh, at least in Europe that I that I know of, um, I think the, the auto leave in Paris was a very well known example. Oh yeah, um, they always said you have homeless people living in 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 it. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. So it's bad. It's really bad. And and then and that's actually what uh, I think to some extent has driven a bad bad reputation on car sharing. And oh, you can't make money, and it's always dirty, and it may never work. Um, so so that's sort of the, the legacy that, that we have to um, get out of as well. Uh, and luckily, I would say that, that uh, we see much more, many more um, sort of effective car sharing operators today. And, uh, and uh, we need some, some, good, uh, um, some good results, some good success stories as well. Mm -hmm. And they yes. are coming and they are, they are available now. Uh, there's been a huge change in the last three or four years. Funny story, um, you could actually buy those um, EVs uh, <laughs> yeah. that were used by Autoleaf at the very end, right? When they ended the service for only 2,000 euros because um, the, the car was so badly built and yeah. it was just not a great car and um, piece of But no guarantee so, on how long it could drive. Yeah, yeah, it was just to get rid of it, right? 2,000 exactly. euros, you just buy one and you have a car. But um, John, just wondering about EV infrastructure and is it really such a big advantage to you? And how many of those car sharing players right now in the North American market actually, Sandra, are using EVs? And do you think, is that going to be key in the future to sustain your business? Or can you also run it on a different fleet? Because of course we know that Green Mobility is doing only EVs, right? But, but is that really so important? What do you think? Are you asking me? Yes. Or ask Anders? No, <laughs> you like, first, because yeah, maybe you have a different idea. Anders is, is obviously very clear in the EV camp. So, um, I will say cities would love to, see, just like cities in Europe, they would love to see the shift towards zero emission vehicles. The challenge for North America and, I, and, and Europe is just further ahead, quite frankly, on that, is it is infrastructure, um, which is why, a, like there are some purely electric fleets like Sacramento, um, that was part of the uh, Volkswagen diesel gate, right? There was a pot of money that was allocated to zero emission projects and Sacramento won that. And so Sacramento now has two car shares up and running um, that are zero emission only. So there are those cities and they, I know, um, I know the person who was responsible to install the infrastructure so that these two could launch and they installed 900 charging points within a year, which is you know, most cities in North America dream of that. Um, so mm -hmm. I think charging infrastructure, we're just a little bit way behind or a little bit more behind, which is why if you haven't, it's more of a mixed fleet. 
like Reach mm. Now, the BMW program, which then became Share Now and now is no longer. Uh, <laughs> they had a mixed fleet in Seattle and Portland um, to you know bring as many as they felt comfortable sustaining from an operational side. Um, and at the same time, making sure that the consumer had in, you know, enough available vehicle, because if you have all EVs and then 75% are, are down or out of service because you can't charge them um, in a reasonable amount of time, mm. then you have bad user experience and people won't, won't adopt it, right? Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a fine balance. And, mm. and I think we, we just, honestly, we just have some catching up to do. Mm. Mm. Are there cities where you will not be able to launch Anders right now, if you look at the European uh, landscape? Well, well, the bold and slightly arrogant answer would be no. Um, so, so, of course, and, and obviously, in, in, in our perspective, uh, it has to be electric, it has to be zero emission. And mm. I don't really see that many excuses for, for not doing it that way. Uh, cities should be driving this, setting clear rules. If you want to have shared mobility, if we are to offer you any kind of advantages, uh, whether it's been parking or uh, accessible or funding, whatever, then the requirement is EV based. Uh, they're doing it in, in Amsterdam already. They've done it in many for many years in Amsterdam. It's a clear uh, requirement. It has actually also been instated for taxis now in Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, you see the same in Paris, in Madrid, uh, that uh, that you uh, can only operate a car sharing in the city if it's electric. Uh, Milan mm -hmm. has a similar thing. Um, so, and and I know that that Hamburg is is uh, planning as well to to have these uh, uh, changes in, in regulation. So it has to be electric. Um, we have to create better city environments. And yes, it is going to take uh, some time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, and yes, it does require infrastructure, but I can guarantee you the infrastructure is, is ready to be made from what is electric uh, electricity companies or, or whoever runs it in the specific cities. But but it's, it's usually sort of a chicken and egg thing. Where I, I spoke with a large uh, utility company a few years ago, and they said, "Well, we're we're going to wait a little for for more EVs to hit the streets." Yeah, but mm. then it's not it's never going to happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you do require some kind of investment, um, and, and what we see today is that, that these utility companies are more inclined to move in this, into this. We see the big uh, petrol stations also actually making charges at the stations. Uh, more and more cities, they are not, they're not allowed, uh, Stockholm is an example of that, they are not allowed to put in um, uh, petrol stations in the city center uh, anymore, so, but they are allowed to put charging stations. And of course, they still have a retail business. So, so as charging infrastructure is being dispersed into different industries, then the, the infrastructure will surely grow. Uh, for us, sort of coming back to my uh, bold answer in the beginning, um, we always we look at a city, and of course, we map out the charging infrastructure. Uh, and we always we are, we are not scared away by a city that has limited or potentially zero infrastructure because we can. We always bring in some of our own. We have also in Cohen, we have charges that is, is uh, reserved for our cars. So we can start a, a new city based on our own infrastructure. Uh, we prefer to have a mix uh, of, of private uh, and, and public, so we can balance that and also that, that we're not entirely using the public infrastructure. Same as parking, we also have some, some reserved uh, home parking. Mm -hmm. And finding that balance. Um, uh, and, and we have to do uh, investments like this also to start the, uh, the development and, and, the, and motivate the city to show uh, a good example of, of how we can actually do that. Mm -hmm. okay. I do, Lucas, I do want to add one point. I think one of the things that um, North American cities are starting to do is because North American cities saw all the car share and share mobility as big business and let's extract, quite frankly, as much value as we can on the parking permit. And I think there's a shift in thinking that, you know, if I want to incentivize more zero emission vehicles, perhaps I give a discount to that group. And then it becomes a lot more feasible if you have to, you know, bring your own charging infrastructure or do more work on the operational side, right? It's, it, you just knocked off one of the biggest ticket items of, of, um, on your P&L. And so you, you can yeah. invest more into... Uh, parking is... 
passing parking licenses are very very expensive mm. expensive and um we've seen actually that um uh, car sharing companies in berlin were uh, lobbying to get the price down it didn't work because actually the city of berlin is making a lot of money uh, from those uh, lovely sharing mobility uh, operators however it worked in hamburg but it actually got cheaper over the crisis and corona and it also helped some of our customers which is great um, fundamentally it should be about what kind of city do we want do we do we as politicians do we as city council do we want to motivate um, the end game or the end, the goal of the city. Uh, if you have a clear uh, sort of target for emission, then I guess, you have to start doing something about it. I guess it, it depends who's running the city, right? And uh, who's actually uh, interested in making it different and who's also prepared to do those bold moves. In Hamburg now, they're going to um, stop private cars from going to the city center. Jungfernstieg, they're actually going to make it car free, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's, that's finally a great move because also the Green Party is in power. So, um, it's helping. Here, it's definitely helping. Um, now, I have one more question that is uh, very bold, actually, also from the public, which is um, with car sharing operators now offering longer rentals, and we also saw that uh, ShareNow is actually offering longer rentals here in Hamburg already, right? They have those day passes, even month passes. Um, are we going to see a decline in um, traditional car rental companies? And are you, in the end, unders becoming a car rental company, as we know one? I think there is there's still a very big difference in car sharing and car rental, uh, fundamentally in, in the way we operate, uh, and, and we're going to keep it that way. Uh, but we have also moved from being uh, traditional car sharing, focusing only on, on, on the city car, um, but we've introduced packages as well. The, the, uh, the biggest one we have today is seven day. Uh, mm -hmm. seven days. So we, and we've actually seen throughout the holiday season, uh, summer holiday now, that a lot of our customers have taken the cars for, for long distance and, and gone to the other end of Denmark. Uh, okay. The car is equipped for charging cards and you have charging stations along the way. Um, so this also enables people uh, who may not own a car uh, to have more flexibility uh, on their summer holiday. And, and uh, similar, we also have weekend, weekend packages and, and so on. So, so yes, there is, uh, there, there is an overlap, um, but remember still that in, in so classic rental company, you have to go to an office to pick up the car. It is a pre, pre booked uh, thing and, and it's a planned thing. Whereas as car sharing is, is more on demand, I need it right now. Um, so there, there are an, an operation, of course, it's completely different. So, so yes, we are moving closer to, to sort of the rental business, but, um, but there's still big differences um, and the, the rental companies are not able to do what we do to the same extent. I mean, six is quite bold. We have I to know. Say. Yeah, I've, they, yeah, they've yeah. done a, a few new things in, in, in Germany. But there's, Absolutely. again, back to uh, similar with the, with the OEM, there is a different, there's an alternative motive behind as well. Yeah. It's right off there running a business. So, so, um, uh, so, so the, there's a lot of complaints about that. What about uh, car rental companies in the US, um, Sandra? And um, are they going to go more into car sharing? And what's happening with them at the moment anyway? Because I saw that Hertz, I think, was cutting tens and thousands of jobs, right? So are they actually going to invest in new mobility? I, well, if I was a car rental company, I would definitely, I would be scared of, of what's coming. Yeah. And I think they are because, I mean, part of it is, you know, the new technologies and car sharing getting into the you know, there's that overlap. But I think the other thing, and this goes back again to more of the, what the pandemic has, people do, now they're, people really don't want to go into an office where there is a risk of, you know, I have to sign paper and exchange keys. And like, it's, it's supposed to be touchless. So I think if I was a car rental company, I would very quickly invest into the technology to make my, you know, offer a, a bit of a different pricing and packaging, but kind of a similar experience. Um, than car sharing. Um, I think one of the biggest competitors in, in, in the US um, on a larger scale to car rental is probably the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, market. You know, tour and get around are really quite big. Um, and if, like when I go to San Francisco, I never rent a car anymore, I get a tour. <laughs> Um, and I know lots of people who do that because it's so much easier. You arrange it, you know, before they'll drop it off at the airport for you. Like there is no handing over key, no upselling of insurance either. 
like it's just a different experience so i think that's probably like on a on a us wide and canadian wide that's probably the biggest scary competitor um for car rental do you agree uh, anders and do you also see other car rental companies maybe going into your business even more well, obviously, it's, it, it is a, a possibility, but we don't see them as the biggest threat. Um, okay. We still see, uh, for us, it, it is about removing the private car. So that mm -hmm. is ultimately our enemy, if you like. That, um, I think that is what we need to reduce. Um, we will surely have um, uh, rental cars as well. Uh, they serve a, a purpose as well. Um, and, and we can't necessarily do the same. But I agree that that there is a difference in... in um, the structure of it and also how do you actually uh, operate that with uh, cleaning the cars and so on. Interesting, interesting. Um, would it help to actually introduce other forms of um, micro-mobility maybe into your services? So you actually also go multi-model, Anders? Well, it's, it's, yeah, of course, it's an obvious uh, question. And then we, we also did some, some research into it. it, it I mean, the, the obvious choice is to put, put a kick scooter in the, in the booth of the car. Um, but uh, ultimately, we came back to uh, that that we are a service company in the car sharing industry. This is what we are really good at. Uh, this is what we can make a really good company. And our focus is actually is to grow geographically. We want to have a lot of locations uh, and, and entire fleet. And I think if you start looking at, at different mobility options, uh, we we are in risk of sort of defocusing the business, uh, mm -hmm. and then we can end up losing everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, we see quite a lot of, of um, micro mobility operators. Uh, I don't see a point in us going in and, and in, in such a competitive market at the moment. Uh, but but on the other side, I could see easily see uh, sort of collaborations with with uh, some of these in, in in different cities where you uh, maybe you, as you were mentioning, they are closing some streets in, in Hamburg. Okay, so you take a, a kick scooter to, to the car and then there's a, a booking sequence uh, where it made it even more easy for you. Uh, but, but our focus will remain to have zero emission uh, car sharing. That is uh, absolutely possible, by the way, with the Wunder platform, because of course we already power a lot of micro <laughs> players, yeah, of the leading, of course, in Europe. Uh, and the US, so uh, if you like, we can talk about that another day. But uh, now I have a, another interesting question that is a bit out of the ordinary right now. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but actually Wunder also has a carpool product, right? So we actually do use uh, carpooling and we do use that use case with mainly B2B companies or big corporates now in Europe. Also actually in Denmark, we run uh, the carpooling service for FDM, which is the, um, the car um, automotive club, right? And um, I have a question here from the Philippines. Of course, we actually used to be active in the Philippines, which you maybe don't know, but we used to be active there. And uh, the question is, um, if I want to summarize it very quickly, um, Uber left Manila, right? It's a city that is um, overloaded with congestion. It's very difficult to go from A to B. In the mornings when I was there in Manila, I had to commute for like two hours and that was just normal, right? Is it possible to have a car sharing model there that would work? And maybe Sandra, because you've also worked very internationally, have you seen car sharing models work in more, um, in such different and more complicated markets? Or is it rather something that you would see in a more developed um, uh, market with like great public infrastructure? I mean, or are there examples also maybe out of maybe Latin America, right? Where you've seen a really good car sharing uh, model work. I will actually pick an example of uh, the Middle East because I think it was a, a city that everybody is like, so is this going to be a car share with Lamborghinis? Um, so <laughs> we worked on the first car share in, in Dubai, um, eCar, and they've now expanded. They're not only in uh, the Emirates, but they're now also in Saudi, operating in Saudi. Um, and they, it, like, you have to find the right demographic that will use car share. So if you look at Dubai high level, you're like, it makes no sense. It's all car centric. There's very little, you know, public transit. Mm -hmm. There's like one line, but you have all these people, you, it's a very international city, right? So you have all these expats that are flown in from all over the world to run companies. Um, and you have certain level that get a company car and then you have a large level that doesn't, but they get housing provided. And that housing is never right next to where they want to be. Like 
nowhere near sometimes they're shopping but nowhere near you know like the attractions or the beaches or even the public transit line so what they've done is they essentially build a transportation option for that specific demographic and that's one of the largest so it's kind of the middle class um in dubai which is why it works so i think it can work now to go back to the question on carpooling and congestion and how um like my strong conviction at the moment is that for the carpooling can only solve so much but carpooling technology if it's used in microtransit so the little jeepney buses which manila knows or is very familiar with but now you make mm. it more technologically enabled i think that's where the carpooling piece really can solve an issue and and become more efficient and microtransit has um just like car sharing has actually seen an increase uh in the last couple of months right because a more mm. nimble flexible but also more controlled option because you can control how many people you let into a bus um mm. right right now in the situation we're in mm, mm, mm. Yeah, absolutely i mean we used to run carpooling very successfully actually in manila and um at some stage we decided to focus more on the b2b segment uh it was um, better for us as a company but um, no, very, very interesting. Um, are there other cities like that you where you would not expect to have any car sharing, like smaller cities that you've seen? And it's actually Lucas, maybe it's maybe maybe uh, maybe a small comment. I think we will see and we will have to combine car sharing with carpooling, um, because the one, of course, is that, that that we have to move people from traditional private cars into shared mobility. Mm. But even though, of course, our car will do several trips a day, we are not we are not reducing enough traffic. So we need to get when I'm driving in in the morning. Okay, so there's a, two other people I'm picking up on the way. That's an actual step, and and, and I'm sure that your guys uh, can can supply us with that uh, solution already. Um, but it's it is a <laughs> it is a needed next step. But right now, um, at least from the cities we're in, uh, there's still this psychological barrier. Okay, so now I'm gonna drive with a complete stranger. Does he smell? Uh, he's gonna talk all the time and so on. But these are barriers uh, that we are breaking down, and we've been breaking down barriers from from the beginning. So mm -hmm. we will have to go into those, and we will have to combine the services. Uh, whether, it, of course, there's a difference from private carpooling into uh, doing it with our cars, but surely they will have to be combined. One more great question, actually, uh, that I find very interesting, because maybe to go back to what Sandra said about Turo and Get Around. I mean, Get Around today is in big financial difficulties, right? I mean, uh, there was there were rumors in the press that was about to be sold, and um, and peer to peer operators are also maybe only fleet operators in disguise, because the majority of cars that they're using are actually run by professional fleets right now. So, isn't it just okay, maybe you have the same supply and just a different front end, right? Isn't it just the same thing now? It's not really private to private anymore, right? Like it used to be, you know, back in the day when I was living in Paris, I was using mm -hmm. Drive it at the end of an acquired by get around and I could actually rent off my neighbor. That's not the case anymore, is it? It's more like it's professional fleets. Case, nah. But I think you all, it's just like with Airbnb, you know, you had mm. the people that all of a sudden bought a bunch of properties and then became mm. like, that's, that became their main job and they were mini hotel owners. I think you have the same thing. And then, yes, you have the large fleet uh, guys that also supply or ensure that there's enough supply. I, so I think it's a mix and, and, and it solves the problem we talked earlier about for car rental companies. So if you're a fleet provider and you can't, like, um, I will actually use BC as an example. So BC, if you don't know, British Columbia has one insurance company. So ICBC, it's a monopoly. ICBC said no <laughs> to peer-to-peer. So what Tura did, they um, teamed up with all the, like there's a lot of really tiny car rental companies mm. all throughout BC that would never have, you know, the backing of Hertz or Avis to have any technology. So they teamed up with them and said, you put your um, fleet into our platform. Now you have access to more customers. So I think they solved kind of that problem um, and it became more touchless and became more efficient. So I think it's just a mix. You have both all of a sudden in it and you never know. You just don't know until you book who you're getting. 
and maybe you don't have to use your your neighbor's car anymore that is about to break down because uh, this this happened to me uh, when I was uh, <laughs> renting in Paris, literally from my neighbor in the same house when driving was just upcoming and working extremely well. Um, anyway, um, there's I, also the the convenience of ha of knowing what you're getting that that sure, it sure. is a standard product um, and yeah. you can be certain that that everything is working and no breakdown. This is actually this is actually something that is uh, great in Paris now and also I think in London it's a company called. Virtual, right? That is in the end doing also uh, on-demand um, airport rentals, right? So you can actually book ahead, plan ahead, get to the airport, get your digital key, um, go pick up the car, and they only have three models. So you always get a model you want. It's great, mm -hmm. and uh, only A classes, and I think Fiat 500s as well right now, and um, working very well. Start a profitable business model already. And um, the best thing of it is you can, you can even do this with our products. So if you wanted to run to your own virtual, not a problem at all. It's possible. But uh, I, I need to end because my um, podcast um, um, webinar master, Marius, is sitting in front of me. He's like, you have to find an end. So um, I thought it was extremely <laughs> interesting, actually, what we all said here. And one of the best discussions I had about car sharing in the last month. And thank you for taking all the time. Uh, what we will do is actually yeah, share, of course, the recording with you. I'm also, um, of course, available for any follow-up questions. We can also, of course, will share um, your contact details, if you don't mind, Anders and Sandra. Yeah. There's more interest all, afterwards. You're all very welcome. Yes, and, uh, and um, I'm just looking forward to seeing Green Mobility in Hamburg and also welcoming Sandra, of course, to Hamburg so we can show her uh, how our car sharing works over here and uh, how brilliant it is. And, of course, to work together in the future. So um, thank you a lot. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Canada and to Copenhagen. And um, yeah, stay safe in those turbulent times. And yeah, let's uh, car sharing grow. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Have a, Have a good, good day. day. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye bye.